for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Ralph. I work for a company called Particular Software. We're the makers of N Service Bus. Um, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but I will say that Particular Software is a 100% remote working company. So we do not have an office. Everyone works at home. And uh, I originally come from the UK. I've been living in Switzerland for a very long time. Uh, but right now, I live in this. This is actually my home and my office. So uh, a couple of months ago, my girlfriend and I uh, decided to take the whole remote working thing on the road. And uh, she's now a remote worker too. And we're going to see how that goes for a few months. And if you're more interested in that, Hopefully, when I get back from Oslo, I'll have the time to start, uh, finally start my blog about it. And uh, I may well do a talk about this next year, if you're interested in seeing how this works and what the tricks are that you need to make it work. Uh, back to more relevant things. Uh, I look after a few NuGet packages on NuGet Gallery. And these are probably the, mo the more interesting ones. Uh, Fake It Easy is a mocking framework, which you may have heard of. Xbehave.net is an xunit.net extension. Uh, LightGuard is a guard clause library. Everyone knows what, know what one of those is. It allows you to write things like guard against null foo uh, in your methods. And there are hundreds of these things. Uh, but I find it really useful to maintain a guard clause library because it's a really trivial package with one, line, uh, one file of C sharp. And it allows me to try out things great new things like Project JSON and the new CS proj and multi-targeting and things like that on a really trivial package, which I then release and people actually use. So if you want to play around with those things in real life uh, with, a, with an easy package, then uh, start up a guard calls library. Okay? A few more won't hurt. And in my day job, I look after the RabbitMQ integration for N Service Bus, because N Service Bus works across many different transports. RabbitMQ is one of them and it's the one that I happen to look after in my day job. And in terms of .NET standard support, uh, Fake It Easy already does support .NET standard version 1.6, Xbehave 1.0, LightGuard 1.0, unsurprisingly, and N Services RabbitMQ, not yet. That is a work in progress. But more on that in a minute. So .NET standard. What is this .NET standard? Did I get that right? Simple. <laughs> How many Norwegians here? Yeah, so did I get it right, more or less? Yeah. It, it, it means, oh, okay, dodgy, yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, it actually means rubbish in, in Norwegian. I didn't really want to say .NET standard rubbish, but it's the only Norwegian word I know, so there you go. So what is .NET standard? In order to explain what .NET standard is, uh, the best way, I think, is to look at what problem it's trying to solve. Uh, so, in the old days, things were very simple. We had the .NET framework. So, you compiled against the .NET framework, and you ran against the .NET framework. Right, really simple. These days, it's not quite the same. Right? We want to run .NET, Core, uh, .NET on .NET Core, on Linux and Mac OS, and uh, on phones, and uh, on various Windows devices. And does anyone know what Tizen is? Yeah, I saw one thumbs up. Do you want to shout it out? What is it? What is it? Right. So it runs on television. It's a, it's, a, it's a native CLR that Samsung have developed uh, for things like uh, smart TVs and smart watches and things like that. So it's, a, it's, an, it's yet, another, yet another .NET platform. But the point is that we want to run .NET on v in various different places now. It's not the same .NET as it used to be. And when you're writing a .NET application, you're very soon going to pull down a, a NuGet package from a NuGet gallery. You're going you're to do that fairly early on in any non-trivial application. So you want to be able to use NuGet packages in all of these platforms. And the solution for that uh, originally was a thing called portable class libraries. Anyone remember these? They're still around. Or as I like to refer to it, the portable class library fiasco. 
And I, sorry, and that sounds a little bit harsh, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain why. Uh, so as I said, in the beginning, things are very simple. You had the .NET framework, and that was it. And then this thing came along, Silverlight. Or as I noticed, I misspelt it, Sliverlight. Um, but that has a certain ring to it. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, it's, it's going to be it's going to be called Sliverlight. And with these two uh, with these two platforms in place, immediately you want to be able to try and use NuGet packages on both of the platforms because. The .NET framework had an enormous amount of NuGet packages available for it. Maybe not so much in this time frame, but NuGet was a thing. And none of those packages worked on Silverlight. So the idea was that we would take the intersection of the two platforms, because there, are, there is a large set of types and methods, what we'll, what we'll refer to as APIs, which exist on both platforms. And we'll call that Profile 14. I do not know where the number 14 comes. If anyone knows what this 14 means, please tell me. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any real logic for these numbers. But anyway, that was called Profile 14. And the idea there is that you compile against a set of reference assemblies for Profile 14, which only define the types which are, defi which are actually in both uh, platforms. And then you will be able to take that compiled package and install it and run it on either of these two platforms. Right, kind of makes sense. When you introduce a third platform to the mix, .NET Core 4.5, and that, anyone remember that? That was a thing at one time. Uh, I don't know what it was, um, but yeah, .NET Core 4.5 was a thing, and the intersection of .NET Framework 4 and .NET Core 4.5 was called Profile 5, and the intersection of all three was Profile 37, for one reason or another. So, uh, oh, and there was not a there was not a uh, profile for the intersection of these two, uh, for one reason or another. So th they didn't always exist, but only for some. Okay, that that works. Uh, let's introduce a fourth platform to the mix. Uh, we've got Windows Phone 8 down here, and uh, there is a fundamental problem with this diagram. Can anyone spot it? The clues in the diagram. I didn't have a place to put Profile 14. See that? Because there's nowhere on this diagram where there is an intersection of .NET 4 and Sliverlight 5. Right? Uh, so it turns out, that, and this is embarrassing for me because I did maths at university. I should know this stuff. I'll just go back one slide. This is a Venn diagram. Right? A Venn diagram is a diagram that maps all the intersections of all the sets on the diagram. This was first described by a British mathematician called John Venn from Hull in England, and he, he described these in, in the 19th century. This is not a Venn diagram because there is no intersection of .NET Framework 4 and Sliverlight 5. Right? This is actually an Euler diagram. And this was first described by a Swiss mathematician called Leonard Euler in the 18th century. And this is another example of an Euler diagram. So, I'm, as I said, I'm originally from the UK, so whenever anyone asks me where I'm from, I say England. Isn't that part of Great Britain? I say yes. Isn't it part of the UK? Uh, yes, it is. So, and, and, and it's Northern Ireland. Part. So, all I have to do is verbalize this very simple diagram and... Uh, and, uh, and job done. Uh, so back to this, uh, this other Euler diagram that we're, that we're trying to draw. Um, there is no space of Profile 14. So I then had to resort to Google and try and find a four-set Venn diagram. And this is what I found. This is actually a four-set Venn diagram. All the intersections are shown. And I can reapply the platforms and profiles. And indeed, we get a place of Profile 14. And we've got this new thing called Profile 136, uh, which is the intersection of all four. And now, so, okay, great. So that's four platforms, right? It's still kind of understandable. But if you look at this list, sorry, guys in the back, uh, this is not too readable for you, perhaps, but 
This is actually uh, one, two, three, four, five platforms, right? There are, there, are, uh, there are profiles which support five platforms. And of course, it's not possible to draw a Venn diagram with five sets. Or so I thought. So yeah, when you, when, you draw, when you draw a diagram for five sets, you have to resort to this kind of frankfurter inside a wasabi bread roll kind of thing. Um, but this, this actually does work. You can, if you squint your eyes, you can kind of see the five sets. And uh, then you can get really silly. This is six sets. Uh, this is uh, seven sets. Uh, starting to look quite nice now. Um, and in, uh, in 2012, a, really, a group of really clever mathematicians from the University of Victoria in British Columbia drew for the first time ever a 11-set Venn diagram, which looks like that. And uh, I, reapplying our platforms to this, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't follow this anymore. Uh, I, made that, I made that profile number up. It's as good as any of the others. Fiasco, right? This doesn't work. This does not scale. Um, uh, and again, ap apologies. Fiasco is a little bit harsh. You know, apologies to the guys that come up with this. The intentions are really good. You know, and given the same situation, I have, may have done the same thing. Uh, but clearly this doesn't scale because every single time you add a new platform, you potentially double the amount of profiles. Right? So, and I don't think anyone really envisaged that so many new platforms would, 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 uh, would be released. So now we've got things like uh, you know, .NET Core and Tizen and all kinds of things coming out of the woodwork. So the, the number of profiles that you need explodes, and the numbers will get longer and longer eventually. So a new solution was needed. And that solution, of course, is .NET Standard. I actually submitted this as a logo, uh, but the team, the team knocked me back. I'll try again. Uh, <clears throat> so .NET Standard aims to do this. Instead of looking at all the intersections between all the, all the different platforms and coming up with a thousand and one different profiles and then making it really, really difficult to decide which profile to even target or targeting multiple ones of them, you've now got just the intersection of all the platforms, this intersection right in the middle, and .NET Standard tries to take as big a subset of that intersection as it can. So what this is saying is .NET Standard defines all the APIs, or at least a subset of all the APIs, that are available in every single platform. So not just the intersection of .NET Framework and UWP, or .NET Core and Xamarin iOS, but the stuff that exists in all of them, just that bit in the middle. What this means is, is you only have one thing to decide to target, a version of .NET standard. And then your library will be available on, will, will be usable on all of these platforms. And the versions of .NET standard kind of look like this. Each version of .NET standard is a superset of the version before it. So .NET standard 1.1 is .NET standard 1 with a few more APIs, and so forth, .NET one, uh, standard 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.6. .NET standard 2 is actually a lot bigger, so this is, this isn't, that's why I drew the circle a lot bigger. And what that means in terms of platforms is this. Uh, these URLs, by the way, uh, don't bother trying to memorize them now. Just memorize the URL to my slide deck which was on the first slide and on the end slide, and you'll be able to follow all this. So what this means is that for .NET Standard 1, your NuGet package that you compile against .NET Standard 1 will be usable against all of these platforms, right? all of these platforms and these versions. .NET Standard 1.1, it will be usable against all of these, and so forth and so forth, all up to 2.0, which is .NET Core 2.0, which is coming .NET Framework 4.61, which exists, and the next version of those other four. Now, one thing worth pointing out here is that when you want to target a version of .NET Standard, don't go for 2.0 unless you have to. Because if you target 1.0, your, your package will be, will be as portable as it can possibly be. Right? So there's always the temptation for us developers to go for the new and shiny. 
So if I'm creating a new project, I'm going to package it, I might think, oh, I'll go for .NET Standard 2. That's the newest. It's got to be the best. Not true. It's a trade-off. So I spoke, to one, uh, I spoke to someone who told me that when they create a new project and they're going to package it, they first of all target .NET Standard 1. And when they find some API they, they need which doesn't exist in .NET Standard 1, they go to .NET Standard 1.1. And then they lose support for Windows Phone Silverlight 8. <laughs> which obviously doesn't really matter. Um, and when they find they can't find something in .NET Standard 1.1, they go to 1.2 and so forth. But at some point you have to make a decision about where you want to stop or where you can stop. So it's a trade-off. The lower the version, the more portability. The higher version, the more APIs you have available, but the less the portability. And of course, this, the, 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 the ramifications of that will change as time goes on. Right now, it really doesn't matter if you drop support for these three platforms at the bottom, right? the kind of dead platforms. Uh, but when you switch from, oh, I don't know, uh, 1.2 to 1.3, you, you're shutting out .NET Framework 4.5 users, which I guess some people are still using. Uh, so it's a matter of trade-off. Another thing about the versions, so 2.0 was originally going to be a breaking change. The declared intent uh, was that .NET standard would follow Semver. So when there's a breaking change, they would up the major version. And originally, 2.0 was going to be breaking with respect to 1.5 and 1.6. So it, rather than looking like this, it was going to look like this. So .NET Standard 2 was going to cut out some APIs which were introduced in 1.6 and 1.5, but it remained compatible with 1.4. And when they announced this, the community threw its toys out of the pram and disagreed with this decision. And that was actually reversed, and they decided to make it compatible with 1.5 and 1.6, back to this. Uh, but they decided to keep the 2.0. Right? So actually, .NET Standard 2.0 in terms of Semver, only needs to be called 1.7 because it is just a feature addition. But they decided to stick with 2.0 because it is a major release. And uh, more on that in a second. The documentation around this is really, really, really good. If you follow this URLs like these, you can see the difference. The actual difference is in an MD file in GitHub between each version of the .NET standard. So this is the difference between 1.3 and 1.4. It's very, very small. It's actually the smallest difference of all. And all I've done here is added a type, added another type, and added a few enum members. Um, so that, that, that's really good documentation. Uh, how does this work? Right, so the first thing is to separate compilation from runtime. Right? These are two completely different, distinct scenarios. When you compile, all you effectively do is link your C sharp, your, your C -sharp uh, to framework DLLs and compile that into IL. You don't actually run anything, obviously. And compilation is very simple. You have this thing called net standard DLL. And net standard DLL comes with the version of .NET standard. And all it does is define types. It is an empty uh, is an empty assembly apart from class definitions and method, uh, method uh, definitions. No actual method bodies. And I can actually show you that quickly just to prove it. Um, this, is, this is that .NET standard. So this is .NET standard 2, .NET standard DLL. And if I go into this, uh, let's say, well, anything really, app domain. Right, so just completely empty. These things, these things don't actually do anything. Those are events, so maybe it's slightly different. Um, array, that's good enough. Yeah, it has, to, it has to do something in methods that return something, because you can't just have it empty, because then it wouldn't even compile. Did you know you could throw null? Interesting, huh? It's actually, uh, the, 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 the constraint of throwing only acceptance types is a C-sharp thing only. The CLR actually allows you to throw anything. You could throw false. You could throw one, two, three. Um, so clearly, this wasn't written using the C-sharp compiler. This was generated, generated IL, I'm guessing. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that's a, that that an empty assembly. And it's only used for compilation. At runtime, things are slightly more complicated. 
So this is, say, um, a .NET Framework application, .NET Framework 4.6, let's say. And this references a .NET standard class library. Now, the important thing to remember here is that the definition of a type in .NET is not just system object. It's the assembly and the type name. So it's, say, MS Core Lib system object is the system object that you know and love. The .NET standard class library is not looking at MS Core Lib system object. It's referencing net standard DLL system object. However, the .NET framework application recognizes system object as being MS Core Lib system object. So what happens at runtime is the CLR looks at the .NET standard library. The .NET standard class library is pointing to .NET is net standard DLL. This is not the net standard DLL that was in the previous diagram. This is net standard DLL that ships with the .NET framework. It's another net standard DLL. All the type and method definitions are the same, but this assembly is different. This assembly uses type forwarding. Type forwarding's been around for a very long time, I think since .NET 1. And type forwarding is a way for an assembly to say, hey, I've got this object. And when the runtime goes to that assembly and says, all right, let's tell me about that object, it says, oh no, actually it's in this assembly over here. It's as simple as that. So when the runtime says to the .NET standard class library, oh, you are, or it sees, oh, you're returning system object which is net standard DLL system object. It looks in net standard DLL for system object. This net standard DLL says, actually, it's in MS Core Lib up here. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see a few nodding heads. So just to show you what that assembly looks like, uh, it is in here. And as you can see, this is uh, all right, this, this is actually uh, the .NET Core one. So that diagram is exactly the same if you've got a .NET Core app. So .NET Core also ships with a version of net standard DLL that points back to its assemblies. And you can see here, this is a .NET Core app version of net standard DLL. And all it's doing is type forwarding everything. Right? There, there is actually no, there, there's actually just nothing in it at all apart from type forwarding. And if I click on, say action, it's actually pointing at system runtime, which is .NET Core's assembly that does part of what MS Core Lib does in the .NET framework. Right. Make sense, more or less? Yeah? All right. Uh, so back to this, so back to the version. So I talked briefly about .NET uh, Standard 2, and as I said, 2 is a major release. And the motivations behind 2 uh, were, came from the feedback that was given for .NET Standard 1. The main feedback that was given for .NET Standard 1 was uh, good, great, but limitations and paralysis. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So limitations. You may have noticed in this diagram here that these circles are fairly big, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and this circle is fairly small. And that is a reasonable representation of the truth because .NET standard, the, the various .NET standard one versions only define a, re a relatively small subset of the APIs that are available on the platforms. And the complaint there was, well, look, I really want to support .NET standard one of the .NET Standard 1 versions, but there are just not enough APIs there for me to use. I just cannot achieve what I want to achieve using .NET Standard 1. So the idea of .NET Standard 2 is to do something like this. Right? The white circle is now much bigger than it was before. And what this essentially does is define a much larger set of APIs. And what that has, the, also the, 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 another effect of that is that it brings all these platforms much closer together. Uh, there is a much larger set of common APIs that they need to, they all need to support. Therefore, they are actually, they actually come much, much closer together. And we've now got way more APIs to target, uh, to, to use in our, in our, in our packages than we had with .NET Standard 1. 
And the difference is vast. Uh, there are something like 13,500 APIs, which are basically methods and properties, uh, in uh, .NET Standard 1.6. In .NET Standard 2, there are around 33,000. Right? So I think it's something like a 142% increase on .NET Standard 1.6, which is quite huge. And I showed you this difference earlier between .NET 1 point, uh, Standard 1.4 and 1.3. Uh, if you try and look at this for .NET Standard 2 and uh, 1.6, GitHub just gives up. Right? It is just... It is just too big to even show, to even render. Um, so the, the difference is vast. So that takes care of the limitations, hopefully. And, um, and I think it does. I think now in .NET Standard 2, you've actually got pretty much all of the APIs that are useful on all the different platforms defined in .NET Standard 2. Paralysis. So this is a very simple graph of NuGet dependencies. So, for instance, uh, Fake It Easy depends on the Castle core package. End Service Bus Rabbit obviously depends on End Service Bus and the Rabbit MQ client. End Service Bus itself depends on AutoFAC and, surprise, surprise, <laughs> JSON.NET. Um, so, the problem here is that if you, if, I, if you want to support .NET standard in your package, you kind of have to wait for all your dependencies to support it as well. Because otherwise you can't, right? If you try and reference a .NET framework package from a .NET standard project, it will just blow up and say system objects is in the wrong place and things like that. And this is a problem because the community is kind of waiting. Everyone's kind of waiting for someone else to support .NET standards before they can support it. We, had to, we, we actually had to wait about six months uh, to support .NET standard and fake it easy. But we had to wait a, a really a long time for Castle Core to support it. And, um, and obviously, everyone had to wait for JSON.NET. Right? Um, but JSON.NET does now support .NET standards, so that's probably solved 80% of the problem. Uh, but this paralysis does continue. Uh, there are still packages which are waiting on other packages, which are waiting on other packages. You, know, you can imagine dependency graphs can get quite deep. You can have four, four levels deep, five levels deep, etc. So the solution to that is very simple. You can reference anything. Right? You, you can now reference from a .NET standard package a .NET framework assembly. Right? This actually does work now. And at this point, I, I, I used to have to say, well, you know, just go and watch this video. Uh, but the, the preview bits were released about, about a month ago. So I can actually show you this in action now. So let's give that a go. Uh, I'm running all the preview bits on a VM, which is here. And we've got the solution called .NET Standard Magic. Now, what we've got here is a .NET Core app and a .NET Standard library. Right? .NET Core 2.0 app, .NET Standard 2.0 library. And what I'm going to do in here is I am going to install a really old NuGet package called Power Collections. Uh, this is a, it's a pretty cool package. It's got some really good, uh, really powerful collection types in it. But the last release of this thing was a very long time ago. I think it was like 2005 or something. And this is a, I've actually got it open here. This is a .NET 2 package. This is .NET Framework 2, right? not .NET Standard. This is the thing from, uh, oh, there you go. It's a, this, is, this is from 2005. That's a really, really old. So I am, I am referencing a .NET Framework assembly from a .NET Standard project. And I'm going to go ahead and actually use it. My usings. And that does compile with any luck. Yes, it has compiled. I'm now going to reference from a .NET Core application, I'm going to reference that .NET standard project. And again, I'm going to use this. So I'm just calling into the .NET standard project with the .NET standard class which exists there. 
few using statements. And if I run this, it works. Right? So we've just, we are now from a .NET Core application calling into a .NET Standard 2 project, which is calling out to an old .NET framework assembly. Right? Paralysis gone. Because I can now build a .NET Standard project referencing any NuGet package which exists in the gallery which supports .NET Framework. Right? That's pretty cool. Now, when I was doing this, I thought, well, why don't I just cut out the middleman? Why don't I just cut out the .NET Standard library and just try and reference the .NET Framework assembly from the .NET Core app? So this is completely irrelevant to this talk because this is this, well, I'm talking about .NET Standard, and this is just .NET Core. But um, I couldn't resist the temptation, so let's give it a try. Uh, so I'm going to add a new get package again. All right, so this is this is just a .NET Core application, right? And I'm installing, I'm directly installing a .NET Framework package. And again, let's just use it. A couple of using statements. All right, who thinks this is going to work? Almost no one. <laughs> who, who thinks it's not going to work? More of you, almost half of you, and quite a few undecideds. All right, let's give it a go. It works. Wow, that was my reaction too. You can, you can write a .NET Core application now and reference any NuGet package that targets a .NET framework. Wow, <laughs> right, that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I couldn't believe it, but the, it, it actually works. So these guys have done something pretty cool under the covers. Um, now, one thing I get asked at this point is, well, what, that's all well and good, but what if that .NET framework assembly calls something that's not available in .NET Core? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's the gotcha, right? Um, so I thought I'd give that a try, just to see what happens. And this is in the uh, rather tellingly named No Magic solution. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reference N Service Bus because N Service Bus does not yet support uh, does not yet target .NET Core or .NET Standard. Um, let's have a look. N Service Bus. Okay. So it, it installs, which is good. Well, it will eventually. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and use it. Don't worry about this code. This is just sort of general um, config boilerplate for an end service bus. And we're going to do some usings again. All right. So let's see if that compiles. And it does, right? It compiles. Uh, let's use, let's reference the net standard project from our .NET Core app. So this is similar to the first solution. This is .NET Core app calling that standard library, calling .NET Framework assembly. And let's call into the .NET standard project from our .NET Core app with a using. And let's see what happens. No magic, right? So, yeah, we've got a runtime exception. Um, in this case, I was actually hoping it was going to—it was going to actually call into a type which doesn't exist to find out what happens there. But in this case, uh, it can't. It, we're getting a system uh, dot configuration uh, cannot be found error because there's no there's no equivalent of system dot configuration in .NET Core, so it blows up. So, runtime exceptions is what's going to happen. Um, so, if you're going to do this. You know, testing is probably quite important. Um, so you know, th this is this is a this is a great piece of magic, um, but it is it is a stopgap. You know, it's just to unlock that paralysis. It's just to it's just to to allow new get packages to support .NET standard early before their that's before their dependencies support it. 
But hopefully in the future, we'll have a situation where all NuGet packages support .NET Standard, and the need for this kind of hack will go away. So uh, let's see. Let's, let's just have a look at what. Oh, yeah, so do try it. You know, go to these URLs. Those are the solutions. Um, so I've got something pre-built for you to give that a try. And if you're going to try it, make sure you install .NET Core 2 Preview 1 before you do it. I, I was a bit confused about what I had to install. I thought I could just install the Visual Studio Preview and it would work, but it didn't. You have to install this as well, and then you can use it in, any, in your IDE of choice, and it should work. So what is this sorcery? How does this work? Right, so again, separate compilation from runtime. Right? These are the two different scenarios you need to think about. Compilation, um, right, so we've got our .NET standard library, which exactly like before is referencing .NET standard DLL. That hasn't changed. We've got our, that is referencing the .NET framework class library. And the .NET framework class library is looking for MS Core lib, okay, in the .NET framework assemblies. However, this is not the MS Core, the, the MS Core lib that is in here is not the MS Core lib that you think it is. It's one that ships with .NET standard, right? And again, it's using type forwarding. So. Let me get this straight. So I, I still don't have an intuitive. I always have to follow the diagram to remember how it works. But when the when you when the compiler comes along and says, "Oh, .NET Framework class library, you want MS Core Lib system object," it looks to this special version of MS Core Lib that's in here, and because this was shipped by the, the, the by the, by .NET standard, it says, "Oh, actually, system object is in .NET standards DLL." That makes sense? Kind of. But that's how compilation works, right? And at runtime, it's a bit more complicated. Again, this is all type forwarding. It's all this kind of type forwarding magic. And this is the, so this part of the diagram with these four boxes at the top is the same as what you saw before. This is the .NET Core application referencing the .NET Core assemblies. It's not MS Core Lib. I think it's system.runtime uh, is one of the main ones there. Where I think that's where system object lives. And the version of .NET standard DLL that is shipped with .NET Core says that system object is not actually here. It's actually in here. Right? So that part of the diagram works. Here we've got our .NET Framework class library. And that is looking for system object and MS Core lib. These .NET framework assemblies are actually shipped by the platform, by .NET Core. So the MS Core lib that lives in here is saying, oh, system object actually lives in system runtime up here. Does that make any sense at all? <laughs> it does. I've actually seen nodding heads. That's good. Yeah, I, it, as I say, I always have to look back to the diagrams to remind myself how it works. It's, uh, it is a bit complex, but you know, if you want to try and understand this a bit more, go grab my slides afterwards and have a work through it. And you know, when you think about how type forwarding works, it, it actually does make sense. And, uh, and it's cool. It's, it's a great piece of magic. Um, so that largely takes care of the paralysis problem. Right, because you can now reference anything. And in a nutshell, that's what .NET Standard 2 is. It's more APIs, 33,000 APIs versus 13,000, and you can reference anything. I put a star here because anything's a little bit of a lie. The paralysis co is caused because the packages that exist on the NuGet library reference, they, they typically reference the .NET framework and portable class library profiles. So the platforms don't ship those hack, those hacking forwards DLLs for every single platform that's out there. They tend to do it for the .NET framework and for, and for PCLs. So the idea is that for any of the new platforms, you'll be able to pull down a package which references the .NET framework or portable class library profiles, and that should just work. So it's almost anything. So how do I port my package? So all well and good. I've got a, dot, I've got a, a, a package which, which targets the .NET framework. How do I port that to .NET standard? Well, there's a really good tool called .NET API port, 
And what this will do is it will take your assembly and it will look at all the calls you're making to, say, .NET Framework APIs. And you can choose which platforms or which versions of .NET standard you want to analyze for. And it will tell you what percentage of the APIs are available on each platform that you need. And this comes in two forms. It comes in, a, again, don't worry about the URLs. They're on my, you can grab my slide deck later. Uh, this comes as a Visual Studio add-in. It's just project, right-click, analyze project portability. And this is actually, I think, going to be bundled in the next version of Visual Studio. So you don't even have to install it explicitly. Or it comes in command line form. You just point it at your DLL. And it goes off and references, uh, analyzes it. And it produces, of all things, an Excel file. I think you can make it you can make it out for HTML and JSON as well, or something like that. But anyway, this Excel file tells you something like this. It says, end service bus targets .NET Framework 4.5.2, and unsurprisingly, the .NET Framework 4.5.2 has 100% of the APIs that it needs. For .NET Standard 1.6, the news isn't so good. It only, .NET Standard 1.6 only has 66% of the APIs that and service bus requires. Right? So a third are missing. Not too good. .NET Standard 2, the situation is a lot better. We've actually got 87% of the APIs that and service bus needs available in .NET Standard 2. So in that situation, what do you then do? What are we having to do? for end service bus to support .NET Standard 2, which is our goal. Well, you can change, first of all. So there are two things, you, there are two types of changes you can make. You can make an internal change, where you might be achieving something using some APIs which, uh, which exist in the .NET framework, but there are another set of APIs in .NET Standard which can kind of do the same thing. So that's, an, that's nice, that's an internal change. No public change to your API. Or you can make an external change. If you, you might be returning something from .NET Framework, which doesn't exist in .NET Standard, and you might have to return a different object. That's a public breaking API change, so you're going to have to rev your major version, assuming you're using Semver. Uh, the other thing you can do is separate. This is really useful. So, for instance, and Service Bus has MSMQ support built into the core, because that was the origi original uh, underlying transport. MSMQ only exists on Windows, so MSMQ support doesn't exist in .NET Standard because it makes no sense on Linux and Mac. So what we've done is we've, we've taken the MSMQ support and put it into a separate package. That's going to be the next version because a lot of people don't need MSMQ. So that's a really good strategy. If there's some piece, if there's some large section of functionality which you know only 50% of your users use, the other 50% don't, Take that out to a separate package, make that package still target only .NET Framework, but make the core target .NET Standard, so that people who don't need that other package will be happy running .NET Standard. That's a really good strategy. And at the end, maybe just throw it away. You know, If there's some uh, suppl you don't need, or you think is uh, really irrelevant, or you've been looking for an excuse to get rid of that API, which only 1% of people use, just maybe you know, chuck it out. But maybe you want to consider change and separate before you do that. APIs and versions of .NET. This is a really good resource for when you actually want to make the changes. So uh, one thing I didn't mention was in API port, in the Excel sheet that you get, in the second sheet, it actually lists all the methods that you call, and it tells you which ones don't exist in the platforms that you've analyzed for and which ones do. If you then want to find out, well, which, which methods and classes do I need to switch to, this resource is really, really good. This actually lists every single API that exists in .NET on every single platform, on every single version of .NET standard. And you can search for things like iData Reader, and it will tell you a little bit about it, what methods exist, etc., etc. And then it will also tell you what platforms it is available on. And you can see that it's available in most versions of .NET Core, obviously every version of .NET Framework. Uh, it only exists in .NET Standard 2, right? So this has been reintroduced. This is one of those missing APIs in 1.x that's been brought back. So that's a really, really good resource. 
Right, .NET standard versus .NET Core, the eternal question. So the, the, the confusion, unfortunately, still exists between these two things. And um, I still get all the questions about, you know, what is, what is one, what is the other? I'm hoping that during the course of this talk, this dif the difference has become more or less apparent. So, you know, .NET standard is effectively a contract. .NET standard says, well, if you want to support .NET standard, you must have these types of methods. That's effectively all that .NET standard is. It is just a contract to say that, to, which just outlines what you need to do in order to support .NET standard. It has no, bo no body of itself. It has no implementation of itself. And there are obviously various platforms which then support .NET standard, .NET Framework, UWP, Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, Tizen, .NET Core. Right? .NET Core is just another one of the platforms that supports it. And unfortunately, things do get conflated together. Like for instance, uh, this is the release schedule for .NET standard. And... Uh, they're actually sticking to the schedule, right? This was actually released on the 11th of May, the preview, right smack down in the middle of the Q2. So uh, things are looking good for the actual RTM. You know, I, I'm actually optimistic we're going to get it in Q3. But if you actually look at this URL, you don't actually see this. You see this, right? And this is actually in the core repo. And, you know, they're all listed together. So, you know, .NET Core and .NET Standard do get kind of conflated together in terms of release schedule and, and, and timing and that kind of thing and development. But they are very, very separate things. You could release .NET Standard right now without .NET Core and vice versa. Um, and this is just another way of trying to represent this. So uh, David Fowler, who's, uh, who, who's here speaking about things like uh, ASP.NET Core, he put together a repo which actually has an analogy uh, to .NET standard and the platforms. And what he's done, he's defined an interface to represent uh, a version of .NET standard, and then inheriting types from that to represent the platforms. So you can see here that .NET standard 1.5 inherits from .NET standard 1.4, because .NET standard 1.5 is a superset. And .NET Core app inherits from .NET standard 1.5, uh, as a Xamarin and Android. .NET Framework 4.6.1 inherits from .NET Framework 4.6, inherits from the version of .NET Standard, and so forth. Uh, I hope I haven't just confused you, but uh, some people do find this analogy quite useful. Uh, so that's another quite good thing to look at. Um, and some future platform, and this is a really important point, because in the world of portable class libraries, when a new platform came along, that would result in a new set of profiles being generated. And in order for my NuGet package to support that new platform, I would actually have to recompile it against one of those new profiles and re-release it. But the beauty of .NET standard is that my package now just supports this version of .NET standard. And any platform can come along and say, hey, I support that version of .NET standard. And my package is now usable on that platform. Right? So that's why I've written here some future platform like Tizen can come along and all of a sudden you've got LightGuard running on your TV, right? which, is, which is pretty cool. So it makes things much more portable and much easier as NuGet package uh, maintainers. .NET standard 2.1, 2.2, 3, what's going to happen in the future? So another thing I've been asked uh, is that um, every version of .NET standard is bigger than the previous one. So does that mean that as the new versions are released, it's going to put a lot more burden on platform uh, providers to support those new versions of the .NET standard? And the answer to that question is yes. It is going to put more burden on them. When 2.1 is released, it's going to have some new APIs compared to 2.0. And in order to support 2.1, I'm going to have to do some work, and I'm going to have to support those new APIs if I'm to support .NET Standard 2.1. However, the difference between .NET Standard 2 and .NET Standard 1.6 is vast, and I don't think there's going to be as vast a release again. The reason I say that is because .NET Standard 2 captures 
an incredibly large subset of the APIs which are useful on all the platforms. So all the, all the APIs that are in .NET Framework 4.6.1 that make sense on Mac and Linux and phones and TVs does already exist in .NET Standard 2. So what's .NET Standard 2.1 going to be? It's going to be small. It's going to be incremental. right? I might be proved wrong, but this is my prediction. 2.1 probably will exist, 2.2 probably will exist, but there'll be incremental change. 3.0, I'm not sure if there ever will be a 3.0. I mean, the marketing guys will probably disagree with me, but I'm not sure there'll ever be a, a sort of real technical reason to say 3.0. I don't think they're ever going to break, by the way. They tried that with 2.0, and that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't really uh, received very well. Um, so the only reason to have 3.0 is like, well, big change, loads of new APIs. I'm going to stick my neck out and say that's probably not going to happen. I don't think I think there's going to be a reason for a vast new set of APIs. It, is a vast new set of APIs suddenly going to appear that makes sense on all the platforms? Maybe something like the new span stuff that's being developed, something low level like that. But you're not going to get this massive uh, set of changes again. And there is a dot, there, there is a body called the .NET Review Board. Uh, which consists of people from Microsoft, uh, Xamarin, and Unity, and other, and other organizations. And this board very carefully considers new APIs for inclusion in .NET Standard. So I think what you're going to find is a lot of really exciting new APIs being introduced in things like .NET Core. And then if those APIs make sense on all the different platforms, you're going to see them submitted to the board, and the board will say, yep, okay, that makes sense on all the platforms, let's bring that in, or no, this really only makes sense for you guys, let's, let's leave that out. Um, so I don't think you're just going to get loads of stuff, stuff being chucked into the .NET standards like that, because this review board is there to sanitize anything that's going to be added. So how did I do? Uh, who here now thinks they have a reasonable understanding of what .NET standard is? Awesome. Okay, that's really, really cool. That's almost all of you. Uh, I, I didn't ask that question when you came in, of course. <laughs> but I'm going to give myself the benefit of the doubt and say that I, I did help out in that, in that understanding somewhat. Who, who here has a, has a good understanding of, what .net, of the difference between .NET Standard and .NET Core? That's almost all of you. I do see a, 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 that's not 100% of you, so I guess some of you still have some questions remaining, so um, I guess we've got a bit of time for questions if there are any. I mean, does anyone want to throw anything at me right now that I haven't answered already? Yeah. Uh, 